Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, uh, dear colleagues and friends, uh, uh, welcome to this uh, panel. Uh, I'm senior international correspondent of HRT. In my professional uh, work, uh, I've tackled um, many times the issue of the others, uh, diverse or different, due to global phenomenon these days, uh, much uh, as well uh, filmed and worked uh, regarding the issues of migrations, uh, refugees and integrations, which I think is something that we will tackle in uh, our discussion uh, today. Therefore, it's my privilege today to be surrounded by three distinguished colleagues uh, as a moderator uh, who really could have a lot to say about the issue and uh, representing diversities in the media models uh, from, from the sector. From my uh, right side, Ms. Milica Pesic, Executive Director uh, of Media Diversity Institute from London. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Then Ms. Uh, Olya Boyar, uh, Head of Radio from uh, Asia Pacific Broadcasting Union, coming from uh, Malaysia, from Kuala Lumpur. Yes. Hello. Welcome. And my colleague from HRT, uh, Daniela Drashtata, uh, president of the Intercultural uh, TV and Diversity Group within EBU, but as well uh, a person and journalist, a colleague who is dealing with uh, intercultural issues and uh, minorities for years now. Uh, and I'm very glad that you are here with us to share some of your experiences. Before I give a floor to these uh, three uh, uh, ladies, do allow me just to emphasize a couple of things that I think might be very useful uh, for the framework for our later discussion, because we have agreed all together that we will not do any uh, boring PowerPoint presentations. It's going to be a discussion and Q&As for hour, hour and a half, depending how much time we will have, because we are a bit late already with the schedule. Uh, I would tell that we all carry uh, with us diverse heritage. Uh, that gives everyone a sense of who we are and belonging. But as well, our common culture needs to respect diversities and what we are. Diversity can stimulate social and economic progress, creating vibrant communities and an improved coexistence. But at the same time, often it can generate inequality, suspicion, fear, discrimination, and sorely conflict. Modern times prove we need to develop an intercultural dialogue. By saying that, I mean acknowledgement and respect for cultural, ethnic, and religion differences. And to refer to culture, not only in the traditional sense, uh, but as well in the anthropological sense, which includes all the practical day-to-day features of a living culture. That includes education, role of women, place and image of immigrant populations. Personally, I do think that the diversity is a key concept of a viable and progressive society. It goes hand in hand with the dialogue in a nowadays world because there can be a dialogue just if we respect our differences. Difference is vital for dialogue. It's a cornerstone of the concept of inclusive journalism that I think that we are going to tackle in our discussion today as well. Mediterranean identity is a living example of unity in diversity. Diversity as being fundamental for social, economic and cultural progress in the Mediterranean. Many times Mare Nostrum has been mentioned uh, in the previous speeches of our distinguished guests. Therefore, I really think we need to cherish and to have a shared Mediterranean narrative. To have it and to keep alive a shared Mediterranean narrative, we need to learn much more about ourselves but as well about the others. And the role of the public broadcasters, it's huge, immense in that regard. And nobody else is going to do our homework. Mm. And responsibility for everything what is written or said, it's a huge aspect of that as well. Thank you for uh, listening to me with this uh, couple of remarks. 
And now I will give a floor to our distinguished guests. First, Militza, would you be so kind, first of all, to explain to us your organization, what you do, what are the bases and the values that you promote, and how you try to put all together all stakeholders in that one process that cherish diversity or tackle it uh, in a proper way? Thank you, Dragan. And I want first to thank the organizers of this event for giving me a chance uh, to share with you the experience of Media Diversity Institute in this field of diversity. And we have almost 21 years in uh, trying to talk to different stakeholders, be it media outlets, civil society, or journalists and communication educators. We believe that without the three of them at least working together, it would be very hard to achieve something which is one of the basics of democracy and its inclusion. And that's where the media is one of the key um, in democratic institutions should play um, one of the key roles. Uh, in Media Diversity Institute, we always say, um, we don't talk about any journalism, we talk about good journalism. Um, and good journalism have to be, has to be inclusive, which means, particularly in case of you here, and most of you here are from public media broadcasters, it's your role not only to show that there is diversity in your society, but to let people coming from different backgrounds um, really talk, really be included uh, in your stories, sitting in your newsrooms, but also being in the, in the working forces of your organizations. And because um, I come from Britain, where we always talk about BBC, BBC, BBC. Yes, BBC has done a great job. Uh, but when you look at their diversity policies, uh, they have achieved some figures. Like they have really 12% uh, of people coming from different ethnic background working in BBC. But when you look at how it actually, where they are these people, you can see as soon as you enter the building, the receptionists are not white, the cleaners are not white, or majority of the, them are not white. The higher you walk up physically, but also in hierarchy of, of, of BBC, the less people of color, the less women, the less people coming from other disability categories. And our definition of, of, of diversity is not only ethnicity, race, uh, religion, it's also gender, it's physical, mental abilities, it's language, it's sexual orientation. And another thing before I show some, a good example, a, a, a best practice, is that it's the role of us journalists, particularly public services, which is supposed to be public good, to hold the authorities accountable. And that's something we don't do very often. And I'd like to tackle that in particular today when I share with you bad examples of journalism. And maybe the last thing before we see it, it seems that all of us here, we are already converted. We already believe that diversity matters. The problem is when we get out of this kind of events, we, we get into the world where extremists on all sides are gradually becoming mainstream. Either we talk about white supremism violent vi white supremism, or we are talking about uh, Islamic uh, Jihad, they are there, and they have much more in common between themselves than with us. So let's see one good example of inclusive journalism. It comes from Denmark. Almost and like a fairy tale from Hans Christian Andersen. You know? Almost like a fairy tale, but this is a, a, an example of, of, of best practice. And then we'll talk about bad practice and how to deal with it. It's easy to put people in boxes. There's us, and there's them. The high earners, 
and those just getting by. Those we trust, and those we try to avoid. There's the new Danes, and those who've always been here. The people from the countryside, and those who've never seen a cow. The religious, and the self-confident. There are those we share something with, and those we don't share anything with. Welcome. Det kommer til at stille jer nogle spørgsmål i dag. Nogle af dem kan godt være lidt personlige, men jeg håber, I vil svare ærligt på dem. Hvem herinde i rummet var klassens klog? Hvem er bonusforældre? And then suddenly, there's us. We who believe in life after death. We who've seen UFOs. And all of us who love to dance. We who've been bullied. And we who've bullied others. And then there's us, the lucky ones who've had sex this past week. We who are broken-hearted. We who are madly in love. We who feel lonely. We who are bisexual. And we who acknowledge the courage of others. We who have found the meaning of life. And we who have saved lives. And then there's all of us who just love Denmark. So maybe there's more that brings us together than we think. TV2 Denmark. All that we share. Great work. Great work, an ideal, uh, which is very difficult to achieve in real life, but we have to stream to try to achieve ideal um, in aim to make a um, citizens uh, feel really included. And because, be, uh, before I go further, I, may, I should maybe declare uh, a conscious bias here. I've been British for 20 years, but I come from a very Balkan country. I come from Serbia, and I worked on public television at the time when a person who became a president of Serbia started using public television to enhance hatred towards the others. And this is something which I emotionally carry on for more than 20 years. So for me, this is not a job. This is something we have to learn if we don't want to pay us, our, our journalistic work with human lives. Diversity does matter, it is there and I am consciously biased when I talk about it. I admit that. Shall we come back to some of your thoughts? Absolutely. Uh, we will continue now with Olya. Uh, Olya, you're coming from a faraway region, but that comprises a lot of public broadcasters, mm. huge amount of people, and perhaps some different concepts uh, when it comes to the inclusiveness or diversity. Yes. Many of the societies there and broadcasters that have a, a role of public uh, uh, voice there start from the different uh, starting point already. Those are either immigrant nations or they're comprised of many minorities. Yes. 
What are the challenges or best practices in that regard when it comes to that issue? Thank you for that introduction. Um, look, I, I might try to start from sort of the, the personal and go out from there. I mean, I, I am, um, I'm Ukrainian. I was born in Lviv, not far away from here. I spent uh, my studies in, um, uh, in Canada. And then I moved to Australia and um, spent most of my life living in Australia. Now I'm in Kuala Lumpur in, in Malaysia. So when you think about diversity by looking at somebody, you really don't know them. You know, I look like any one of you, and everywhere here I go, everybody speaks to me in Croatian because I look Slavic. <laughs> when I'm, uh, I was in Italy, everybody spoke to me in Italian because <laughs> I look Italian as well. So it's, um, I guess, what you see is not what you get, and, and that's the most important thing you need to remember, that we don't always look so different. Um, I mean, as a result of not looking so different, I mean, I didn't experience some of the issues that others experienced when they came. I mean, I came as an 11-year-old to Canada, and a lot of my colleagues were bullied because they looked different. I didn't look different. I just, you know, didn't dress the way everybody else dressed because my mother wouldn't let me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, um, and then if you if you go outside of that, I mean, I now work for an organization that has, uh, we have uh, 272 members in 76 countries. Uh, if you think about Asia Pacific, I mean, you have to think, you know, cast your mind to where it starts. We go up towards Russia and, you know, Turkey and then down through the whole of the, you know, uh, Far East and Near East and, and down to New Zealand, Australia and all the islands in between. <coughs> so it's quite a lot. And if you uh, think about the, the top 10 most populous countries in the world, six of them are in Asia. And that comprises uh, more than three billion population. So out of the, the whole of the world, uh, you know, we've got the population in Asia and the Pacific that's uh, more than, you know, any, anywhere else. And I was um, talking to some friends over a break and because I did a quick Google on um, language diversity. And uh, I wanted to ask you a question since you've all had coffee now. <laughs> what um, can you guess? What's the what the most div uh, ling linguistically diverse country in the world is? India. India, number nine. Any other guesses? <laughs> Indonesia, or oh, number nineteen? Not even close. So, um, just to put you out of your misery, the top Britain. three. <laughs> Britain. <laughs> no, <laughs> the, the top three are Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, and Solomon Islands. You need to be a good geographer yes. to find it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Papua New Guinea has 820 spoken languages. Indonesia has 300. And uh, India has a few more than that. <laughs> so, I mean, just to, to give you a, a sense of the diversity in that. So, when we're talking about uh, some of our very large broadcasters, um, they're broadcasting to indigenous people who are very diverse within their own countries. So they're not talking about migrants so much. In, in fact, um, Asians are very accepting of migrants because it's always been the case. You know, I mean, Malaysia, the country where I uh, live now, uh, we have um, Malaysians, uh, Malaysians comprise of ethnic Malays. Uh, there are a significant Chinese population and significant Indian population, and that's been through trade. And it continues to be like that. I mean, you know, we talk about the, the Belt and Road Initiative of uh, China now, and, you know, that was the first trading route that was built. And now it's uh, being built but on a digital level, you know, to unite the same people together. So um, the diversity really means something quite different uh, in that we are speaking to our own people from uh, who, who speak differently, who, who are from different cultures, from different uh, islands. I mean, I have a little video that I, I might just play, and it's from Indonesia, not uh, the most diverse, but one of our most diverse uh, broadcasters, uh, Radio Republic Indonesia. And um, it's, it's a promotional video, so you have to excuse that, but it, it, it gives you uh, an idea of the kind of challenges that they work with. Now, uh, Radio Republic Indonesia, their motto is unity and diversity. So when I ask them to bring something that shows that, uh, I asked them to talk about the challenges they have in actually keeping that diversity common <laughs> somehow. So if we can maybe play that for a minute. Indonesia is a big country. There are more than 7,000 islands that has been named and 9,000 of them have not been named. 
In total, Indonesia have 17,000 islands. There are 300 ethnic groups in Indonesia that consist of 1,340 ethnic groups with 121 local languages. That refers to one language, which is Bahasa Indonesia. This is, of course, a huge challenge for RRI as public broadcaster. RRI have 97 broadcast stations with 222 relay stations and 6,028 employees across Indonesia. This becomes a spears of spirit and RRI dedication for our nation, ethnic diversity, cultures, customs and traditions, trusts, beliefs, and political opinions. With other elements in the country, RRE do our part to attach diversity for unity in diversity and unity of Indonesia as a nation. It is an essential position for RRE as public broadcaster. RRE is not only obligated to provide information, but also as a media to conserve cultures to create nation cohesion. RRE also welcome digital era. On its 73rd anniversary, RRE provide the listener with application and feature that made our listener see or watch our broadcast online. In its development, RRE have radio picture platform with its motto, see what you listen. Radio visualization without becoming a television to fulfill public request. RRE net can be accessed through video live streaming we organize RRI main programs in RRI Net. Pro 1, Halo Nusantara. Pro 2, MLC. Pro 3, Indonesia Menyapa and Alia Rohali. Voice of Indonesia, Indonesia Today. Realizing huge influence of YouTube in digital era, so RRI used this mini platform to get closer to our listeners. RRI also have several channels in our YouTube account, such as RRI Corner or Video Corner RRI. RRI Play is an application to listen RRI broadcast through Android application on your smartphone. Even if you are abroad, you can still listen in to RRI broadcast. RRI use social media to promote programs since a long time. The social media name for RRI is equated. And use Can we get? Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this so, is uh, just to say, it's quite a challenge to be media <laughs> content manager or editor. Yeah, having like in mind a hell of a job. <laughs> I mean, I, I wanted to just um, say that I mean there there's a couple of more uh, issues that kind of overlay on all of this because I mean this is uh, one uh, country, Indonesia. I mean uh, we we have India who's equally you know th they've got um, something like 270 stations you know in one uh, one pocket of India, um, and also uh, they they broadcast in many many languages to their own people. So, um, but, but another layer of challenges is that the, the median age in, in uh, those countries is in the 20s, okay? So when we're talking about how do you, you know, I, I go to uh, these kind of uh, conferences a lot and, and in Europe, um, also in the States, you know, they talk about how do we involve young people. There's, n there's not an issue in Asia because there are so many young people, you just employ them, you know, <laughs> that's, and that's how you get through. But I mean, th th that is a huge challenge because also those young people are very well connected. I mean, Asia is one of the most connected uh, places on earth. I mean, you, you can get, you know, perfect 4G reception under a rock, you know. It's, it's, uh, and this is why, I mean, the, all of those services that they talk about, your social media and all, you know, uh, visual radio and everything there, they try everything possible to reach as much of the population as possible because it's, it's like, but on the other hand, you, we have um, uh, members like um, uh, Japan, you know, very populous country, one of the, I think it's number 10 on the most populous list. But uh, it's very monocultural. Their their median age is in the 40s, you know. So it's it's quite a it's a huge huge difference. And in the way that they approach their broadcasting is also di uh, very different. So. You're going to come back to this, especially social media and responsibility and spreading the words and diversity issue uh, through the social media. Daniela, for years now you are tackling the issues of minorities and intercultural dialogue. One would say as well you are involved in the uh, uh, 
pan-European project sort of saying, uh, and a, a program called New Neighbors. Could you tell us something about that and your experience after a couple of years of dealing with uh, those kind of programs? Just to add a little bit, uh, we always think in Croatia that it's so challenging because we officially recognize 22 minorities. And then when I look at this, what you just showed, it's uh, uh, just a piece of cake, uh, what we are dealing with. Uh, within EBU, we have this expert uh, intercultural and diversity group, group of experts who deal with these topics. And uh, for the last 15 years, we've been producing uh, documentary co-productions. Uh, we found a certain kind of uh, language that we use in these films. First of all, we gathered together because in diversity departments all over, uh, we didn't. Uh, we found some one common thing, and that was the lack of the money. And we always wanted to have a high quality series that will give a European overview how certain countries are dealing with these topics. So we found a model called uh, You Make One, you broadcast all, and then broadcasters invest a little bit more than they would usually invest in their documentaries, but uh, for exchange they get the whole series for the broadcast. That's one thing, and then the other issue was always how to find a, a topic that's universal and that will work in all countries. Uh, as we deal with diversity, three years ago, we, uh, it was uh, in these years when uh, there was the biggest number of refugees coming to Europe and uh, we were just listening about the numbers all the time and how many on the sea and how many in Lampedusa and so on. And then we uh, decided to uh, start the series that will be really character driven and that will uh, search uh, a bottom of integration. And what we found as a bottom of, of integration is your first neighbor. Because uh, you can be open as you want to, but uh, when, uh, and you can say you are open, tolerant, accepting, and everything, but then when it comes to your to doorstep to your doorstep, then it's completely different. And uh, for the last three years, um, there were, I think, uh, 12 or 13 broadcasters who joined uh, this co-production. And then uh, last year, it turned out that uh, new neighbors um, can become EU-founded project. And together with uh, some very re powerful uh, civil society organization, organizations, and one of them is Media Diversity Institute that Milica represents here. Uh, we created a project, and it's a one million euro project now uh, that we got Hello. from, <laughs> yeah, that we got from uh, European Commission. It means that uh, nine broadcasters that are participating at the moment are in a very luxury position of receiving some EU money, so production is, uh, well, we, we will we expect to, to have high quality production. Some of the conclusions from, could we see perhaps a trailer from uh, the New Neighborhood uh, program or your conclusions or we tackle that? Yeah, I would say let, let's watch a video. Uh, it's, uh, it's, let's say, a summary uh, of a first season just to show you um, how we wanted to, to go deeply into the mindset of uh, local neighbors and uh, newcomers. Beste mevrouw meneer, we willen u graag informeren over de komst van nieuwe buurtbewoners. En vanaf 1 november komen daar 22 vergunninghouders te wonen. Nou, daar komen ze te wonen, aan de overkant. Dus heel vlakbij. Je weet niet eigenlijk wat voor mensen het zijn. Ze kunnen zich alsnog ontpoppen als terroristen. Dat weet je nooit. Wat is er met de kamer? Ik heb een kutje. Ik heb een kutje. Ik heb een Communicatie niet bestaat. Crni, ti su crni dole, skroz desto dole. Znači, kad uči, znači desto dole u podumu sam skroz crni. O, ulica nije promet. To je to ilica. Nema tu dućana, nema ništa. Znači, svako ko prođe ulicu, mi se znamo. 
I onda kad nam se desi situacija, ideš svojom ulicom, ako nam nisi u svojoj ulici, u nekoj drugoj si državi. <laughs> Hallo. Hallo. Oh, hoe gaat het? Hi, goed. Ik ben Bila. Ik ben José. Ja, welkom. Ja. Hallo. Kom Bina. Ja. Uh, hoe lang zit je hier nu? Hier in de uh, week. Uh, oh. In week gereden, ja. Ja, ik heb jou nog niet uh, voorbij uh, zien komen. Ja. <laughs> Ja sam teo stvoriti neku komunikaciju, ja sam počeo poznaviti da kad ulaziš u moju kuću, osjećam ja ću te prije poznaviti, ne problem, ulaziš u moju kuću, ja ću te poznaviti. Ali onda od zdravlje, ne moj, mislim, neko moraš i ti, onda ako te ja puštam u svoju kuću. Completely different, this is the opposite in Africa. They think they should welcome you as long as you come from a far, far place to come to Africa. They should show you the culture, sometimes they will organize a big party for you, or a dance so that you see African dance, you know, you don't see that here, you know. But I understand this is different cultures, you know, like, it doesn't mean they are bad, but they are reserved, you know. Ja, in het begin uh, denk je wel, wat gaat er nou gebeuren? Het geeft een heel onlustig gevoel. Ik had echt een gevoel van, ik wil hier weg. Ja, dat gevoel is helemaal weg. Omdat je ze nu ook kent, hè, een paar. Je moet ze allemaal nog eventjes kennis meemaken, maar uh, ja, ik heb er wel vertrouwen in... Uh, dat het goed gaat komen. The stairs come on part of the building and used by all. I'm the only one who take care of the maintenance and cleaning the stairs. As long as you live in this building, your duty and obligation is to take care and hygiene these stairs case. Dan. Dan. <laughs> Ovaj, pomoć i ovaj, ove stepenice. Klinje njega. Odušenje njega, jel' da? Ja sam vjero. Kume kletaj. Don't be shy now. Ja sam vjero. Ok. I'm glad to meet you. Ik hoop het alles. I mean it. Dank u wel. Dat alles goed met je gaat. Ja. Het gaat vast goed komen. Ja. He? Ik voel me heel verscheurd, omdat ik aan de ene kant wil ik ze graag helpen. Zijn ze voor mij welkom? En aan de andere kant denk ik van ja, ik wil het eigenlijk helemaal niet. Want als je kijkt naar die vluchtelingenstroom, het zijn allemaal mensen met, met een hoofddoek om. Allemaal. Ik denk van ja. Zo wordt Nederland nooit meer van Nederland. So this proves that as well integration is two-way uh, path or road and that we really need to first learn much more about ourselves and the, the others, as I said. Milica, uh, many smart people have said that migrations are the biggest challenge for this civilization in the years to come. In many ways, economically, demographically, socially, uh, security-wise, uh, ethically, uh, in that regard, uh, when we involve media and reporting about migrations, where diversity is a part of the whole puzzle, you know, what is the recipe for the optimal reporting? How do we report? Do we need to, of course, contextualize things with the knowledgeable journalists? And where is this thin red line when report ends, if there is a hate crime, for instance, or hate speech, uh, that we need to tackle, but as well not to promote? When there is a long question, there is a short answer. No, <laughs> uh, migration is not a problem. Uh, it's Challenge. It's there, it has been there all through history. Several continents we've mentioned today have been made population of those continents of migrants. European Union, before the financial crisis, had very clear figures that they needed 40 million laborers, labor workers. So there is a need for people with certain skills. In Britain, 
media and politicians have used migration, immigrants, refugees uh, issue um, to build their populist discourse. If we let all uh, people who are not uh, first and second generation of Brits leave Britain, um, our health system would stop functioning. Uh, Brexit, Brexit happened because of that as well, in one way Brexit or the other. Brexit happened because migration was the issue used by, by not only populist, but by far-right far uh, 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 politicians who have hijacked political and public arena. And that's one of the reasons why we feel that migration is a, a challenge or a problem. No, it's been used. It's just you know one of the of the things we we have to find the way to benefit from, as many countries and economies have been benefiting from all through history. In what way to uh, uh, report responsible? We will have now European elections. Would Britain mm. be part of it or not? It's the other question. But nevertheless, we are even here in Croatia witnessing this uh, public discourse, taking into the account uh, those kind of issues. Uh, where is this thin line from your experience? You are educating as well, having uh, different programs, uh, uh, cooperating with different institutions, mm. uh, not just British ones. You know, mm. what is your feedback? Well, as we are, what we are going to do through New Neighbors Joint Project, it's first like let's deal with facts. The problem is that uh, over the last several uh, years, well, decades, I can uh, I can say, uh, the emotions are taking over the facts. So you can see that even in the coolest emotional society, emotionally society such as Britain, when I moved to Britain 25, six years ago, I thought, I'm now in a safe heavens. No emotions, rational, pragmatic, I know my rights, I know, you know where to find my rights. Then we have two or, or three um, lunatics who stir up the whole society and suddenly a farmer who is going to lose if Britain gets out of the, uh, of the EU says, well, as far as we get our sovereignty back, I'm fine. What sovereignty? Britain has been very present in the European Commission. I've been going to Brussels for 20 years for the fundings and grants. I talk to Brits in the European Commission. So it's trying to find what works politically to, get political, uh, to get, gain political power. For us as journalists, we have to go back to the basic. What are the facts? And I'd like to use the, the, the example of Christ Church, if you allow me, yes, because it's quite significant what happened there politically, on political level, and in, in the media. Some people would say it's the same tune only different venue. There was Norway, there was uh, Brussels, there was Paris, there was London, there was Stockholm. Boston, Stockholm. It's the same kind of tune, just different venue. It's either violent white uh, suprema uh, suprematists or uh, uh, far right, uh, simply uh, terrorism, or it's jihadi kind of terrorism. So what is really uh, admirable, admiring, is that the Prime Minister of New Zealand s came out and said clearly, this is a terrorist attack. And there is a UN definition what is terrorism. So for journalists, it's not a big deal to you know, use the definition and fit into definition. It took almost 12 hours, BBC, to use the same term. They were first talking about attack. Then they started using the term terrorist attack with quotation marks. 12 hours later, they used the term terrorism without quotation marks. So the politician, and we all know, and here I come from the Balkans, we say the fish stinks from the head downwards. So if the politician don't come clear with this, this is then what media do. In New Zealand, uh, in New Zealand, media took the same line. It's diversity which matters. There are 200 ethnic groups in New Zealand. There are 160 languages. It's diversity which ca we care for as a value. And this happened, as the Prime Minister said, it happens because of the values of New Zealand. So the media were very uh, careful how to report. They produced the news. They did not show the video. 
uh, they did not show the, the image of the, uh, the terrorist, and that's something I'd like really you to tell me, how did you cover this? Did you show the videos? Did you show the face of, of the terrorist? Because there is this term which is more and more used, like uh, giving oxygen uh, amplification if you show the video. Um, are you giving a platform to terrorists? Because that's all what he wanted. He was very media savvy. He used a uh, 4chat, 8chat, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook to spread his manifesto using the, the great exchange uh, uh, concept, which is very right-wing concept uh, present. So yes, our role as journalists is to provide the news, to provide the information. Yes, we, the media, traditional media, legacy media, are not anymore uh, the gatekeepers of information. There is social media, but they, have, they don't need to follow the same rules and, and ethical values uh, and ethical codes we as journalists have to, to do. So this is where New Zealand went and media and British media, Daily Mail, I happened to be on 15th of March in Tallinn in Estonia and I was supposed to talk like this at 10 o'clock in the morning before going to the conference. I checked the news, saw uh, Christchurch and I changed my presentation and put the, um, uh, um, there was a Daily Mail uh, website, um, uh, auto uh, live, like just, first part of the video. So put that on the screen. And there were like 60 people in the audience, uh, all media content producers, meaning not only journalists, but people who post all sorts of things on the, on, on the platform, different platforms. What are you going to do with this? How you are going to share this information? Um, so this is a question I'd like really to, that we discuss together. How do you report on terrorism? Are you, by reporting on terrorism, actually helping terrorists? Because, you know, some TV stations, like in Australia, show the video. In Britain, we couldn't see the videos on televisions, but Daily Mirror uh, provided the link. And uh, uh, The Sun um, uh, uh, tabloid, uh, instead of putting the pictures of victims, which was predominantly way of reporting on the issue in, in New Zealand. So focus on victims, on the impact of terrorism. Give a voice to those who have suffered and being impacted. They had a picture of the terrorist as a lovely angelic boy and uh, suggesting what that, yeah, we might be far right, but we are angelic far right. So. Uh, talking about terrorists instead of victims, that's another mistake very often uh, journalists use. And then there is journalism of care, I can talk about it, but um, I'd we like We might to come back in Q&As uh, to this uh, mm. issue and case of, of Christchurch, uh, but uh, I would agree that the New Zealand Prime Minister has showed the empathy, but within the, the, the normal uh, boundaries as, as well. Dignified. Dignified. Uh, where in Europe many politicians, including Croatian ones, do cope with that kind of challenge. <laughs> uh, Australia or Kiwis that are sometimes referred as a younger brother of Australians have been mentioned. Mm. Uh, I just wanted to come back to the Australia. You have had uh, uh, experience from Canada mm. and Australia, uh, being raised there or educated and as well working in Australia, SBS, managerial posts, even some commissions that are dealing with uh, media mm -hmm. rules. Uh, many times Canada and Australia have been taken as the best models of multicultural diversified societies. Uh, Australia, uh, is it all pinky, like perhaps uh, uh, from European perspective it looks like, because this is the immigrant nation, and how diversity is it's, uh, tackled in the Australian media. Mm -hmm. uh, I must say that I had a uh, 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 pleasure to work there and we did a documentary about regular migrants <laughs> and everything is pinky but there is the other side as well and representation within the Australian media yeah. which is some kind of problematic mm. issue there. Yeah, I mean the, the, the whole um, issue that we've just been discussing uh, in New Zealand, the Christchurch uh, terrorism attack, it's a very close one to my heart because it was uh, an Australian lunatic of course. 
that perpetrated it all. And um, I agree, you know, when you use those photos of the angelic young boy, um, it can be problematic. On the other hand, I think it's uh, sometimes powerful to say that uh, these people are among us and they look just like us. So, you know, be careful what you wish for because it's not, you know, it, it's, it's not the, the, the person that looks so different than you that often has these sort of views that you might need to be uh, wary of. But um, in terms of uh, media, I mean, you know, it's, it's such, I could talk for days about multiculturalism in Australia. I mean, this Australia has been built on, on migrants and, and everything that has happened that's been good for Australia has been as a result of the migration and the effort of migrants. Um, and there has been a skewing in the last probably 20 years of, of the way that migrants are being viewed and, you know, this uh, uh, basically politicians using the border issue, the security of borders. I mean, Australia is so far away from it. I mean, it, it's so ridiculous to talk about insecure borders when you have to take a boat that goes for days and weeks to get to Australia. It's not like you can walk, you know, like you do, you know, the migrants do here. So, um, so there's been this hysteria that's been whipped up for basically political purposes and for elections, you know, and it's uh, you, in, now, you know, just before an election is called, you know, same thing is being whipped up. But I wanted to just sort of illustrate the, the difference in, because we, we talk about the public media and, and uh, there's so much other media than just the public media. And I have to say that when you, the people that you, do, that you talk to and the younger populations, they don't watch public service media, they don't listen to public service media. So if you want to turn them, you have to actually be elsewhere. Um, or like, so I'll give you a, a, an example. This, um, Social any, media. Yeah, anyone heard of um, Egg Boy? No, uh, you have. So, so what I mean, this this is illustrates what uh, what happens in Australia. You know, so the big media come out and they, you know, and, and they do that. You know, shall we talk about terrorism? Shall we not talk about terrorism? And the, you know, uh, our um, the the Australian Prime Minister came out and tried really hard to look really emotional when he was talking about it. And then there was a a, a senator called Senator Anning who's. Um, who really wasn't elected. It was a, just a peculiarity in the Australian system that someone else, some, another senator was, uh, um, he was replacing another senator and he never actually got elected. He, in, in the 2016 elections, I think he got something like 19 votes. So uh, he comes out and he says, well, you know, of course this whole thing happened because uh, um, uh, New Zealand allowed all these extremists from, you know, jihadist nations to come to New Zealand. And as he was saying this, a 17-year-old boy took an egg and smashed, smacked it on the back of his head. From then on, he became egg boy. I mean, this guy, the senator actually turned around and punched him twice, so, which is, um, you know, not very nice. But that act of defiance from a 17-year-old boy who just took an egg and threw it at his head, and people asked him, like, why did you do that? And he said, well, he was so ridiculous. He was saying things that were so ridiculous, I just could not stand by. And that was the only thing I could do because they wouldn't listen to me. They wouldn't take any questions. So he threw an egg at them. He became an overnight sensation. Within an hour, there were over a million views mm. on YouTube, on every bit of social media. Everyone in Australia, and, and now there's a movement to elect him the Australian of the Year, <laughs> <laughs> which is really funny. But you know, and that's the you know, the, it's the good and bad of of social media. But so you know, young people they go out and they make a statement in different ways. Not always. And he said, look, I know this is not the right thing to do. You know, nobody should go out and plaster you know politician with eggs or tomatoes. But sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. So um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the popular opinion. And what you hear in the media or from the politicians are often completely different. Um, and as a nation, I think Australia st still struggles with that, like every other nation struggles with it. But I think we manage, b just because of the plurality, I mean, Australia has two public service broadcasters, ABC and SBS. SBS uh, broadcasts in 68 languages on radio. So um, it, they're very aware of the issue of diversity. So I think by and large, it's not a problem, but uh, tackling uh, those, those lone voices that get airing on social media and everywhere else, that's the challenge for all of us. Not to forget, just to come back to this representation of uh, minorities or diverse in that regard into the uh, uh, mainstream Australian media. Uh, mm -hmm. By chance, I talked with Mr. Walid Ali, great mm -hmm. guy who has uh, the project show. He was awarded 
Mm. Uh, he's a Muslim, <laughs> very outspoken, mm. uh, even uh, uh, making uh, critics of Islam or yeah. bad things of, of Islam. But by the votes of the viewers, he has been elected for the person of the year. Personality uh, of the year. Personality yeah, of the year. Yeah. Uh, but he's, uh, uh, you know, on everyday uh, basis still uh, dealing with that or coping. And finally, he said himself that, uh, you know, the reality of Australian society, which is not white anymore, mm -hmm. uh, Indians and Chinese have taken over the white uh, immigration as well. You know, finally, he has been given the citizenship uh, by this award, not himself as well, but the whole group of, of people. And this is something that still is not... Uh, perceived good mm -hmm. in some part of, of Australian public, you know? Yeah, I think it's, you know, uh, if we talk about that, I mean, you look at commercial media, I mean, he is in the commercial media, and commercial media is overwhelmingly white, um, you know, and um, even in all the, you know, all the popular soaps, Home and Away, and, you know, and everything else, that you look at them, and it, it's still very much along the white, black uh, division. And when we say black in Australia, we mean Aboriginal. I mean, the uh, Aboriginal Australians have been there for 50,000 years, but you don't see them very often. And when you do see them, they, you know, they, they, they're the, like Stan Grant, who used to work on CNN and others, and now he's back in Australia, and he's, you know, the acceptable face of, uh, of Aboriginal Australia because he's, you know, he looks a bit wider, but um, it, there's still an issue. I think there's more issue with um, indigenous representation than there is with um, sort of representation of, of others. I mean, uh, BB, um, ABC and SBS, there's no issue. I mean, when you when you watch them, you see representation of yourselves. And that's the thing, that you have to be able to see yourself on television. If you don't see yourself, you cannot identify with this country as your country. Um, and, and that's the divide that I think a lot of countries have, so. Daniela, uh, uh, dealing with new neighborhoods, uh, we have spoken about your experiences, and you said that it's quite important to, uh, you know, uh, intrude with those kind of the ideas into the lowest level of, of our uh, co-citizens or, or people living around us. Why is that so important, you know? Uh, because uh, the whole mission of what we are doing is to uh, to convert people. As Milica said, we are maybe all converted here, but the audience is not. And uh, at the moment, uh, as I said, there are nine broadcasters. We are in the um, casting stage uh, for the series. And we look hard for those characters uh, with whom our um, audience will be able to identify. Uh, meaning s mm, it's kind of easy to find uh, interesting immigrant and uh, asylum seekers or asylum holder story because if they tell you how they came, you already have a story. But it's hard to find a local neighbor who is willing to talk openly about how they feel. And we don't want to find uh, locals na local neighbors who will just welcome refugees because uh, with that kind of person, we think that we will lose our audience immediately. At the same time, we don't want to deal with those who will never change their opinion, who are xenophobes, uh, too nationalistic, and so on. So mm, we are looking for those characters who are just ordinary people, maybe a little bit scared of uh, newcomers, but who are willing to change. With that kind of character, we think that the audience might identify with, and then they could, through a local neighbor, actually meet new neighbors. And that's quite important. And just to, to go back to a social media, uh, with, uh, within EBU and uh, all, all nine broadcasters are European broadcasters, Broadcasters, and we are all into a girl blocking and not putting anything on internet. We hate to put anything on YouTube because it's American company. We don't want to share it because our audience is paying for what we do and so on and so on. So what we did is uh, mm, the the Syria the series has um, uh, one part for social media. So each broadcaster produces uh, uh, we call it one minute clip, although it doesn't have to be one minute 
that's not a summary uh, of a documentary, but it is something special. At the moment, I'm working uh, on, uh, I work on the other uh, international co-production, also within this uh, intercultural and diversity group of the EBU. It's called Free Spirit, about creative people who just go against the mainstream. And uh, in Croatia, we are about to film a vlogger who is the first gay vlogger in Croatia, which is a kind of taboo because he is the only one. And uh, with this young guy who is 23 years old, I learned so much about social media. I asked him at the beginning of the research, do you watch documentaries? And he said, yeah, well, someday, so what did you see? Well, I don't actually watch documentaries, but I would watch if there is a summary. What kind of a summary? 40 second summary. And I was like, oh my God, you spent so much time uh, filming these long length documentaries and then somebody is saying 40 seconds. And then I said, can you give me an example? And he said, well, I just saw recently there was photographer, he was filming some ducks and then those ducks came over him. And it was like, oh my God. So we really have to think in a different way. So um, I would like to show you uh, one minute that we did in Croatia, which is absolutely not a topic of the film, which is something completely different. And it was filmed by chance, but that's something that we used for social media to trigger our audience. You know, when we talk about the marriage and you told me if, if uh, I will marry to you, that I will change my religion and then I will uh, begin a Muslim. <laughs> no, I know, it's your work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for the, your work, you uh, change. Yeah, you know, I know, I you. know. But then I told you that you are here, you live here in Croatia, so you have to change your religion no, and never. become a Catholic. No. <laughs> and become a Catholic. Never. Never. Never my life, my child. <laughs> but I don't know nothing. I don't know anything about the That's very Muslim. Easy. I don't know how to pray. I don't know I nothing. Show you. I didn't. I, I show never. You. <laughs> I never go in some. Uh, I go to my show everything. Really? Mm. You will show me. Yes. <laughs> and what if I don't want to change my religion? Okay, you want to, no problem. No problem. So we can be um, uh, married and without changing uh, religion. Hmm? Yes, it is no problem. Yeah. She looks more interested in the phone <laughs> than he does in the marriage. <laughs> yeah. uh, we found out that uh, humor is something that works well when you really want to tackle some uh, different questions. A little bit of a humor helps to digest it. Happily married? or They're still together. Okay. I just met them. <laughs> uh, in this... Uh, story of converting, as we have put it within the brackets or uh, quotation marks. Um, do journalists who think that they are doing a good job, a positive approach, uh, uh, giving good values, have any ethical boundaries? Or they should have? Well, it's, I, I don't want know whether to call it boundaries, ethical, but there are uh, codes Limits. of ethics. There are codes of ethics because it's a profession which needs uh, codes of ethics like a, a, any other uh, profession. And the, every serious uh, media outlet needs to have some kind of uh, principles for journalists to, to follow. So uh, it's not that complicated. Uh, if you know that you can hurt, that your words and your, your, the pictures you offer can really hurt your audience, can get them go somewhere else, then you have to be careful how to to uh, talk to your audience you don't talk if you love your children and you do uh, then you try not to call them the stupid little one though we do that uh, you try to find the way for 
for your child, you know, to listen to what, what you are saying. So the same is with journalists. And sometimes uh, we say the problems are not journalists. It's those who, who make decisions in the media outlets. And that's why we try not to work only with journalists, because you train journalists, they, they produce fantastic content. Then they go back to the newsroom and the editors say, oh, that's, you know, that's interesting. Uh, when you become an editor, do whatever you like. Now I'm in charge. So we try to work with media decision makers for them to really embrace diversity and understand the values. You say that the young people are going somewhere else, they are going somewhere else. Uh, they are not like uh, German uh, uh, VDR. Uh, their pop their old, um, viewers are 60, over 60 years old. So we know that the young people are consuming information somewhere else. So you have to go there. I want just to go back to the egg case because we are going to use it as an example uh, of civic engagement. This young man used eggs, okay? Um, but he got the attention of the media. Better than a stone. Well, <laughs> maybe that's the next step. <laughs> but we, all, we, what we, we will use the, the, the example to say, okay, you have to find the way to get engaged because you're a citizen and you have the rights to have a say and to be heard. Maybe citizen arrest is something which in Australia would work, like it works in Britain. We have a, a, a gay activist, a Pit, Peter Tatchell, who loves doing citizen uh, arrests. And then he did uh, do that in Moscow. He was heavily beaten, because in Moscow it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but in, in London he did, he arrested uh, Mugabe, when Mugabe was uh, uh, in London as a Zimbabwean president. He just put the, uh, what do you call it? Handcuffs. Yeah. yeah. Citizen, and, it, and he grabbed the, the attention of the media. So you have to look where you want your audience to be, how to approach them. 70% of people who voted, uh, of young people in Britain, voted to, to stay in the European Union. It's another generation which consumes a more traditional kind of media who decides. So, the most important is where is your audience and to understand what is reality. We did a study in the European Union, uh, how is religion and ethnicity covered by the European Union media? And what we found out that somehow editors, chief editors in the European Union media be believe that Europe is still white and Christian, which has been not the, the case for decades. So get the reality, get the facts, and try to separate emotions from the facts. Could we, do you agree perhaps that we see that last video that we uh, might tackle when we come back to these ethical norms no. or not boundaries, but limits or, or responsibilities? It's uh, again, Danish uh, video and something that our Danish colleagues have done. Jeg hedder Abde, og jeg er 11 år. Jeg hedder Sara, og jeg er 9 år. Jeg hedder Rati, og jeg er 9 år. Jeg hedder Skallet, og jeg er 7 år. Hvor kommer du fra? Danmark. Jeg kommer fra Danmark. 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 Er du sikker? Ja. Yeah. Hvorfor? Fordi jeg er født i Danmark. Fordi jeg er blevet født i Danmark, og jeg er vokset op her. Fordi jeg er blevet født i Danmark. Jeg er blevet opvokset derhen, og jeg kan godt lide Danmark. Og det er sjovt at være derhen. Nej, du er ikke dansk. Hvorfor ikke? Man kan ikke sige, at hvis man henter hele verden til Danmark, og at de så får nogle børn i Danmark, så bliver de børn danske. Hvorfor ikke? Du er ikke dansk, så.
Du er ikke dansk. Jo. Nej, du er ikke dansk op det. Er ikke. Du er ikke dansk. Jeg føler mig dansk. Hvorfor? Fordi at jeg har det sjovt her i Danmark, og jeg føler opvokset, og jeg har mange venner her. Hola. It's uh, distressing, but a bit controversial might be as well, but we wanted to show as well that, you know, good intentions uh, and, you know, Machiavellism sort of as well okay. saying, you know, why uh, and why the, the, the issue of identity has become so much important media wise these days and how is it tackled? What do you think from your perspective? And where are the boundaries? Oh, look, uh, I mean, it's. <laughs> You know, th there is um, you ca talking about media is is very difficult because media is so big. You know, we talk about PSMs, we talk about you know social media, we talk about bloggers, uh, YouTube. You know, people on many different platforms. So I think the first problem is that when when we talk about media, we tend to lecture the public service media, who by and large does the right thing. Um, so, uh, but um, the problem is that our our viewers are not where we are. So. I mean, we need to know what our viewers and listeners are listening and viewing when they're not with us in order to actually uh, address some of these issues. Um, and I appreciate, I know, the, uh, the work of the institutes and, and all of that, but, you know, when you talk about, uh, like, in terms of journalists, but, uh, you know, when you're talking about journalism in a news cycle, it's... You can't then also say, look, you know, journalists, you, you journalists should report like this and you should report responsibly because um, the news cycle takes over itself and it has a life of its own. You know, you, you, you should be reporting what's there. You cannot be the news. You, you have to report the news. Um, of course, when you're doing documentaries, when you're doing, you know, uh, social uh, sort of stories, it's a completely different thing. But... It's not. It's not that easy. Just to. It's. I think it's simplistic to say that you, uh, we we must create opportunities to you know for people to be seen equally and things like that. Because I th I think it's by and large it doesn't happen like that in real life. So we have to actually train <coughs> people to talk honestly, uh, without hyperboles and without you know sort of uh, raising the issues to the heights that they don't deserve to be raised. But we also need to be on every platform really every platform and not just you know our own um, uh, platforms and and force people to be where we are and and this is not just in Asia but everywhere else in the world I mean um, in Asia most of the broadcasters are on you know not just on Facebook and Twitter I mean on Facebook uh, honestly many people are not on Facebook anymore many people under 40 are not on Facebook anymore and they're now on telegram and TikTok and and, and everything every other so y you actually have to follow your audience because they are not going to follow you. Um, you know, things like podcasts that are huge, you know, in, in many parts of the world and there, there are podcasts about news and there are podcasts about, you know, storytelling podcasts and there are uh, current affairs podcasts. And a lot of people listen to those and they're really uh, very popular and most people who listen don't realize that they come from public broadcasters because they don't go to the public broadcasting site. But that's okay because your message gets through. The point is that your message gets through to all those platforms. So I think we have to be platform agnostic and we have to sort of stop the division of, you know, uh, we are public service 
we're doing the right thing and people should listen and view us. It, it just doesn't happen anymore. I think we need to accept the reality that our viewers and listeners are everywhere. And to and adopt to and to make Can a strategy I? for new media. Yeah. Uh, there are different platforms, mm. I agree, and, and a public broadcaster should, should go there too. But public broadcasters, at least while they have this kind of statues, uh, have to follow it. Mm. It's their document and they have to follow. Um, we are not pushing for avoiding the news. We are saying, be careful how you report the news. Mm. Uh, in Austra Australia, you can go to our website and fi find the articles from Australia by media analysts from Australia analyzing how some Australian media covered New Zealand case. So it's like, would you, if you were editorial, uh, if you had editorial power, would you show the video? No, no, I wasn't. So in an that's what I'm position. talking about. But, but You'll everybody, inform. it will be different. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't uh, teach your journalists how to cover. Uh, the, the whole thing about being on every platform is not being different on every platform. It's, it's actually putting your message, uh, uh, the right message, with all of that training and all of the, uh, the codes and ethics that you t teach your broadcasters and journalists across all platforms. It doesn't matter. Like Being platform agnostic doesn't mean that you, you are silly on this platform and serious on that platform. It's actually getting that message across so that people start to recognize you. I mean, there was a case very in the last 10 years with CBC in Canada. CBC needed some money from the government, and uh, the government did a, a survey and realized that um, most Canadians did not see the difference between CBC and every other commercial uh, player in, in Canada, a commercial broadcaster, because they looked exactly the same. They were taking uh, ads on every platform, on every program, and, and they looked exactly the same as all the uh, channels coming from America. So the government actually cut their funding significantly. So what they did and it was they rebranded themselves back into public service. They've taken uh, ads out of news, out of children's programming, and, and you know put them heavily into sports. You know, Luckily for them, they've got the hockey, you know, which mm -hmm. <laughs> so all of, you know, 90% of the advertising goes there. But that's so, um, you know, and that's the point of difference argument, you know. I think Melissa was talking about the responsibility mm, yeah. and standards. You are quite mm. right. Mm. Media do need to follow, you know, their audience and, you know, it's 21st century, I mean, of course. And the Australia thing. But it's we very have shaped that audience. Yeah. <coughs> the audience is the way it is because we, as the media, made them that way. So we can't now say, oh, look at this audience. They don't understand what we want to do. But we made them that way. So I don't think we, we made them that way. I think, I think the, um, the com communication revolution has made them that way. Well, not, according to Eurobarometer, mm -hmm. uh, after the family, media are the main mm -hmm. source of prejudice among the the. the the EU mm. citizens, so we have to take that responsibility. Oh, of course, I think uh, the, the, the big definition of media, you, you need to, you know, w what cons constitutes media. Uh, and just before Q&A's, uh, or we right away go to Q&A's, uh, I thought that we will tackle a bit uh, the issue of religion as well, which it's now, you know, in 70s or 80s, it was in specialized magazines. Nowadays, it's in the headlines of the news. But nevertheless, we want to use this opportunity to communicate as much as possible. So please, any questions from the audience? Please. Could you just uh, present yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for this occasion. And I'm very emotional about this topic. Uh, and very happy to attend this meeting because, um, first of all, I'm a Serbian journalist living in Rome. My name is Marina Lalovic. I'm a few of uh, foreign journalists working on Radio 3. Uh, also, thanks to some editors-in-chief who believed in diversity. I must underline this, uh, that uh, fact, which is a bit of the rare in a general media landscape, uh, not only in Italy, I would say. I really enjoyed your presentation, but I would like to, to ask Daniela, which I really loved the project of New Neighbors and everything, um, regarding how, is it diffi how difficult it is to tackle the diversity within your newsroom, or is there any department for diversity, because there are uh, several faces of diversity, as we know, in the Balkans and generally speaking, but how is it difficult on a daily basis to bring the diversity issues uh, within your 
uh, work environment. Thank you so much. Could I rephrase? Is it sexy? You know, <laughs> is it self? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, of course. How is it joking. difficult with your colleagues and, I don't know, your chiefs to bring diversity issues? Well, my chiefs are in the first row here. Good. <laughs> so please listen. <laughs> uh, and it's not so all pinky. Uh, we used to have a diversity department for, I don't know, 25 years. Last year we decided to uh, not to have it anymore, so there is no diversity department at HRT, and uh, I'm not so sure about it, uh, but I hope that our management wanted to get diversity everywhere because uh, that's the ideal model. If you mainstream diversity, then uh, then it's great. And many broadcasters did the same. They just closed their diversity department saying we will mainstream it. And then there is no diversity. I'm sorry to say so, but that's true. And uh, when it comes to Croatia, we have really white country and our minorities are uh, national minorities, old minorities, language minorities, religious minorities, and we have a special uh, magazine for them and short uh, documentary program on a weekly basis on minorities in Croatia. And uh, some of minority groups are happy with it, some are not. Uh, mm, that's something that I would mm, say it's normal, and we do struggle, but uh, at the moment that's the destiny of uh, majority of public broadcasters in Europe, so I would say we are not very special in that area. Can I just say, actually, uh, to that point, in Australia we had the same journey, so everyone used to uh, count diversity and had diversity departments, and then slowly they said, oh, you know, we got to mainstream everything, and it actually stopped. And the, the lesson from that is that if you don't report it, you don't count it, it doesn't, it, it stops ma uh, being uh, something that matters. So, um, whereas if, if you can, uh, you know, demonstrate that you've got people, and, and it, it's, it wasn't important just for the fact that there were diverse people, but women in the workplace, uh, women in, in different a uh, areas and, and uh, jobs in the workplace and how they're actually, you know, pr uh, proceeding through the workplace, as well as people of disability, people of different religions, all of that, and, and once you stop that, it actually just, it goes under the radar. So it's, it, it doesn't get mainstream, it just disappears. Milica. Uh, there, there are different models. Uh, 25 years ago when I came to Britain, th there were little ghettos for, for different minority gr groups, like uh, Saturday morning was Indian Hindu language, and then you know the mainstreaming of diversity became uh, the, the, the flag uh, policy of BBC. They still have diversity uh, department, uh, but they try to, uh, in the content, particularly flag shows such as primetime news bulletin, to really have diversity. And right now, the, 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 the most popular kind of policy is 50-50, meaning that every show they have, uh, whoever they interview, 50% of the interviewees, uh, of the sources, have to be women. But because we journalists are very often a bit lazy, so somehow I'm on that list. <laughs> and because the list is still very short, so instead of being on BBC once a year, because there are lots of women who can say something, I appear every month. So the list has to, to but we know how it works with journalists, so, so give me your contact. So I think it's good to combine the two, to, to keep diversity department, and then try to mainstream diversity. And I want to give a comment compliment for, to, to what uh, Daniela has been doing and, 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 and your TV uh, in this EBU project called uh, new, uh, news, new Neighbors. This is the most active together with the, the Dutch television uh, partners who are really trying to bring the stories that everyone in the, in, in, in the EBU would be watching. So um, there's still a lot of to be done, but you are doing well. Compliments. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, um, thank you for your uh, presentations. Um, I would like to know uh, regarding the Danish uh, television. Um, when you have uh, such a strong uh, will, 
um, you think that it's necessary to have first um, a support of the politics? Because is this an initiative of the Danish uh, television or was it first a political uh, will, a strong uh, will to do it? Um, I said that there, should, there is a need for political will because I'm trying to see reality. And reality is that um, the government, um, the parliament, talk and media have to uh, pass the message from there. I don't know fully the case of Denmark. We found it on, on, through Google. We always look for examples of bad and good journalism related to these issues to provoke a, a debate. Um, as I said at the very beginning, the role of media, particularly public media, is to, to hold uh, the authorities accountable. So maybe Danish television came with this program because they knew that, well, we know that now um, the, the, it's, the, right, right it's wing right wing coalition. Uh, coalition. Um, the, the several governments in the European Union now have right-wing uh, parties or coalitions. So I don't know the case of Denmark, but it's great that the television public uh, try to, to bring this. I'm more interested in the kids' stories and interviews um, from the ethical point of journalism, how you, you know, they obviously wanted to show um, what does it mean to discuss uh, about integration, about being different, but to use kids who got really so emotional. I've seen this probably some 20, 20 something times. I get uh, emotional each time I see these kids, but apparently the kids have been explained after the the, the shooting, what was the whole story about, and then they apparently understood. Uh, but this is you to tell me what you think and uh, how would you deal with both issues, with the promo material and with interviewing kids? Next question, please. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for this high level and uh, diverse debate, I would say. Um, but my question goes to Daniela. If, um, I'm talking about the, you know, the new project at EBU. I belong to a company that, com that belongs to the big EBU company of family, uh, which is located in the southern shores of the Mediterranean. Just to name it, is the Aldurian Television. And um, it seems to me that this project is Euro-centered or Euro-oriented project. And my question is very short and straight. Is there any chance to see one company like mine um, included in the future in this big project. Thank you. It is, it is absolutely, but uh, this season as we receive the um, EU money that comes directly from a commission, uh, each and every bro broadcaster participating is a member of the European Union. We even had a discussion with a Serbian broadcaster and although they are they'll soon, we hope, become a member of the European Union. They were not able to join this co-production because they were not receiving the money. And although uh, co-production was open for all members, it's completely different when you start from uh, different starting points uh, where um, EU broadcasters received uh, money for the production and others wouldn't. But yeah, let's uh, keep in touch because uh, new neighbors are coming from uh, southern shores uh, of Mediterranean of sea. So it would be brilliant to have you in actually. They just uh, emphasize the need that we have that shared Mediterranean uh, narrative. Any more questions or we could uh, make concluding remarks, short ones? Uh, Milica or? Oh, sorry. No, <coughs> mine is not a question, it's uh, an answer to the question that was raised before ab about Denmark. Um, Jack Womatson from the European Broadcasting Union. Unfortunately, one year after the Danish television produced the TV2 EBU members produced this video, the government decided to abolish the license fee in the country and uh, they have been punished with a 25% reduction of the budget over the next three years. So not necessarily what we do as public service broadcasters is please to the politicians, and sometimes you have to pay the consequences of what you do. So you see, the more you prone for diversity, the more 
this hearts a certain political discourse that is based on uh, hate uh, against a part of the population in order to make political capital uh, on their own interests. So sometimes you, you pay prices for that. You, you have to be aware. Thank you. Thank you very much for your patience, my distinguished guests and colleagues, for your uh, thoughts uh, and experience. Since that you have uh, shared with us, uh, I hope that we might have learned uh, something out of it and that uh, some networking has been established uh, uh, today. Uh, hopefully we will discuss diversity in our everyday life uh, uh, in weeks or months to come, especially we in Europe as uh, national broadcasters because we will have European elections and I think diversity is going to be migrations, integration, one of the biggest issues that uh, would be tackled in our program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.